Senior, come to order. Uh, I think it would be appropriate to start the day in light of uh, Memorial Day being yesterday and in light of the, the tragedies and some of the finest among us uh, suffering at the hands of uh, people that should be taking care of them if we start this hearing with a moment of silence. So if you please join me. Thank you. I would also like to ask anybody who served in the military, and quite honestly, their family members as well, because this is a service and sacrifice that affects the entire family, if you please rise to be recognized. Thank you all for your, your service and sacrifice. The the purpose of this hearing is to make sure that uh, the rest of America honors its promise to you. Uh, that's what really is the heart of this hearing. I, I truly want to thank uh, everybody who's appeared and, and attended this hearing today. I want to in particular thank the surviving family members of, of Jason Simkuski and Thomas Bayer and Chris Kirkpatrick and Dr. Car Carrington. In March of 2015, we held a hearing where the family members stepped forward and whistleblowers stepped forward and provided powerful testimony. And it was powerful testimony. We heard from Dr. Noel Johnson, and Mr. Ryan Honnell, and Marv and Heather Simkuski, and Candace Dellis. I have to believe that their testimony had an effect on the officials that were present that day from the VA. It is that type of testimony, is that type of highlighting a problem that is going to be required if we are going to honor the promises of the finest among us. I do want to thank my staff for doing, I think, an extraordinary job of laying out the findings of a very rigorous, a very comprehensive investigation into how exactly the problems within the Toma healthcare facility went on for so long without being corrected. Uh, I do encourage everybody, because I think we have a couple hundred copies, to grab one and read all 357 pages. Uh, it lays out exactly what happened with, quite honestly, not all the information. I do want to say that certainly it's been my experience as I've traveled around the state of Wisconsin and visited VA healthcare facilities, the vast majority of the doctors, of the nurses, of the administrators are doing an excellent job. They are highly concerned about the finest among us, about our veterans, and they're doing everything they can to honor those promises. But the fact of the matter is they're working within a single-payer, government-run, bureaucratic health care system. And there are just inherent problems. Uh, for example, inherent problems of accountability. Inherent problems, unfortunately, within an Office of Inspector General that was not living up to its mission, who I would say was captured by the, the VA itself. So the Office of Inspector General under Richard Griffin was loyal to the VA instead of being loyal to the finest among us and to the American public. This committee in particular, the Senate Oversight Committee, relies on independent and transparent inspectors general. Government relies on them. The only hope we have of fixing problems is if you have an inspector general's office, the independent, transparent watchdog actually doing its job. And what is very apparent in our 350-page report and the almost four or 5,000 supporting documents is that for years, the Office of Inspector General within the VA did not do its job. And what is an even greater tragedy is that these tragedies here at TOMA 
I believe could have been prevented had the Office of Inspector General done its job. As far back as 2004, Dr. Houlihan had been referred to as Candyman. A number of people back as far, as far back as 2008 and 2009 were trying to raise the alarm to a number of departments, a number of agencies, a number of offices. And yet somehow, those alarms did not go public. I do want to play real quick, if, if uh, people are ready. Uh, and you can follow, by the way, you can follow along on page 48. There were logs that uh, Heather Simkuski asked us to uh, basically use the Capitol Police to get into her husband's cell phone to get a record of, of his call logs. Now, during the course of our investigation, as we contact the FBI about potential contacts as it relates to, to Toma VA, they claimed there was no contact. And yet, we actually have a, a voicemail message left by a member of the FBI, which I'd like to play right now if we can. Now, now, we asked representatives of the FBI and the DEA to appear today, and they, they declined. They are also continue to convey to, to this committee and to our staff that they have no record of ever having been contacted by Jason Simkuski. I find that puzzling. I find it troubling. Again, the, the failure of the Office of Inspector General to live, up to, to, mission, to live up to its mission was really at the root cause of why these problems continue to go on uh, for so long. I do want everybody to refer to page 208 and 209 because I think this is a classic example of how the Office Inspector General, in their inspection, in their investigation here, narrowed its scope, refused to look beyond its scope, and as a result, didn't do his job. 2008, according to our report, during its site visit, this is the first site that's visit uh, directed by Dr. Mallinger to the Toma VA following reports uh, that began in 2011, the hotline reports. But during its site visit to Toma VAMC, VA Office Inspector General officials interviewed both Dr. Houlihan and Deborah Frazier. During the interviews, both Office of Inspector General physicians and Special Agent Porter of the VA OIG's criminal division observed that Dr. Houlihan and Ms. Frazier appeared to be impaired. Now, unfortunately, during that initial in investigation visit, uh, Mr. DeSanctis was not present. So the Inspector General's team held a phone conference with Mr. DeSanctis, and in 2009, you can read how they informed Dr. DeSanctis, or Mr. DeSanctis, about their concern with Dr. Houlihan and, and Nurse Frazier potentially being impaired, potentially being drug users. There are numerous whistleblower reports that also suspected that Dr. Houlihan and Nurse Frazier were drug users. I want people to read exactly what the Office Inspector General did. All he did was inform Mr. DeSanctis and suggest that Mr. DeSanctis perform drug tests on those two individuals. We have no idea whether those drug tests were ever performed. I, I would think if uh, they were, back in 2012, these tragedies might have been prevented. So again, the, the bottom line of, of what this report shows is it was the failure of the Office Inspector General and the failure of other agencies and offices to actually highlight the problems that they were made aware of that allowed these tragedies to occur. And we'll get into this further in terms of uh, uh, the testimony and our questions to it. I, I do ask that my written opening statement be entered in the record without objection. With that, uh, Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Um, I want to thank you for 
organizing this hearing today, and I also want to add my words of appreciation to your staff, to Senator Carper's staff, and to my uh, staff uh, in terms of the undertaking uh, that uh, uh, resulted in this work product. It is um, a very significant uh, investment on their part, and we appreciate that. I think the fact that we are both here again today uh, sends an important message to this community that we will continue to work across the partisan aisle in order to address the problems at the Toma VA. In fact, I would describe it as there is no aisle. As Americans, we are united. Uh, we are united by an eternal bond with the families and friends of our fallen. And we are also united by the sacred trust that we have with our veterans and their families. Um, today, as we hear the story of how that sacred trust with our veterans and their families has been broken, it's important for us to keep in mind what unites us. One profound thing that I have learned about the tragic problems at the Toma VA is that veterans, their families, and whistleblowers all want the same thing. They want answers and accountability, but most importantly, they want solutions to the problems at the Toma VA so that these sort of tragedies never, ever happen again. And what I'm committed to do is fixing what's been broken. What I'm focused on is restoring the sacred trust that we have with our veterans and their families. The committee's report makes clear much of what we have known for some time. The problems at the Toma VA have had tragic and preventable consequences. The report sheds light on the failures surrounding the deaths of Craig Farrington, Dr. Christopher Kirkpatrick, Jason Simkowski, and Thomas Baer. What this report can never do is repair the damage that their losses have had on families, many of whom are here with us today. It's just as clear to me today that it was, a as it was a long time ago, that the VA prescribed Jason Simkowski a deadly mix of drugs that led to his death. And those responsible at the Toma VA for this tragic failure should have been held accountable long ago. In fact, they should have been held accountable before Jason's death. The record is clear. For far too long, serious problems have existed at the Toma VA, and they were simply ignored or not taken seriously as they should have been by the VA and the VA Inspector General. My office was just one of many voices who were trying to expose the problems at the VA. When my Senate office was first contacted in March of 2014 with complaints about the Toma VA, including prescribing practices, they came from an anonymous whistleblower, someone who still remains anonymous today. We immediately brought those concerns to the Toma VA, and then to the VA Office of Inspector General, and then to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs headquarters in Washington, D.C. Four months prior to Jason's death, I called for a full review and investigation from the Toma VA. Two months prior to Jason's death, I called for a full review and investigation from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and the VA Office of Inspector General. On August 30th, 2014, Jason tragically died at the Toma VA as a result of what was medically deemed mixed drug toxicity. The Simkowski family lost a son, a husband, a father, and we lost somebody who faithfully served this country if there is one thing that I want to come out of this hearing and one thing that comes from this report, I want it to be this. I want everyone to hear the voice 
of Jason's wife, Heather, who said, and I quote, when I look back at the past, I want to know we made a difference. I want to believe we have leaders in our country who care, and I want to inspire others to never give up because change is possible. Jason's family, just like veterans and their families in this community and communities across Wisconsin, are not interested in finger pointing and a blame game, and neither am I. That's why over the past year, I focused on solutions to the problems at the VA. We've worked across party lines to advance reforms that will improve transparency at the VA Inspector General's office, um, to strengthen protections for whistleblowers, and to provide stronger oversight of VA prescribing practices. Um, I authored a reform that was recently signed into law which requires the VA Inspector General to submit reports to Congress and make them available to the public. That is the standard that must now be met. Last year I had the honor of working with Jason's family to develop legislation to provide the VA with the tools that it needs to prevent this type of tragedy from occurring to other veterans and their families. One year ago, um, I introduced this bipartisan legislation in Jason's name, and it's earned the support of many veteran service organi organizations, and I'm so proud, Senator Johnson, um, to have you join in this effort. I am pleased that the House of Representatives recently passed a version of Jason's bill, and I'm equally grateful to members of the Senate Veterans Affairs uh, committee for their bipartisan support of Jason's uh, bill, um, the Jason Simkowski Memorial Opioid Safety Act. It's a critical reform and it continues to move forward. Families like Jason's have a story to tell and it needs to be heard and the movement of their legislation is strong evidence that their voice is being heard. My goal is to put these reforms in place to prevent Jason's tragedy from ever happening to another veteran or any of, the veteran, any of our veterans' families. Change is indeed possible. Heather's words inspire me, and it is my hope that they will inspire all of us to work together and to prevent these problems and tragedies from ever happening again. I thank you, Senator Johnson, for providing me with this opportunity to join you today, and I look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Uh, Senator Carper, who is our ranking member of the committee, is, has a statement and minority views memo that he'd like entered into the record without objection. Uh, it is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you'll all four rise and raise your right hand. Swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. Our first witness is Mr. Sloan Gibson. Mr. Gibson is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Deputy Secretary Gibson is accompanied by Dr. Gavin West, Senior Medical Advisor, Clinical Operations, Department of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Gibson. Let me begin by expressing my heartfelt sympathy to the Simkowski family. Um, I know that no words can ease the pain of your loss, but it would be remiss if I did not uh, recognize the courage and the compassion and the deep devotion that you have displayed in all the work that you've done since Jason's death uh, to make a real difference in the lives of many other veterans. Thank you, and God bless you. I'm accompanied today, as you mentioned, by Dr. Gavin West. Um, I wanted to point out prior to his appointment to the responsibilities you, you uh, described, Dr. West served as the Chief of Primary Care and Associate Chief of Medicine, accountable for the delivery of evidence-based, high-quality, patient-centered care uh, across VA. He continues to practice medicine at the Salt Lake City VA Healthcare System, where he teaches medical students and treats veterans in primary care with a focus on pain management and substance abuse. 
He understands the issues and challenges we're facing at Toma from years of traveling across the country working to optimize clinical care. As many, sites, as many site visits to VA medical centers include visits here at Toma. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, is that Dr. West served as the co-chair of VA's National Opioid Safety Program. Jason's death forged us to dive deeply into the Toma system. What we found was an organization facing numerous challenges in dire need of change and new leadership. The problems at Toma have been well documented failures related to the prescribing practices of controlled substances, examples of inadequate oversight of care delivery, and failures related to culture. We own those challenges and problems, those failures. I own those problems, those failures. Avoidable, avoidable harms to veterans are unacceptable. When they do occur, our obligation is to act with urgency to investigate and prevent a recurrence. At Toma, there was a clear and inexcusable lack of leadership that created and exacerbated these serious problems. The excellent frontline staff here at Toma that you've acknowledged in your comments, Mr. Chairman, working under new leadership is fixing those problems. On October 5th, we appointed Victoria Brahm as acting director. In her new role, Vicki didn't wait to take action to improve veteran care. On November 27th, she began executing Toma's 100-day plan. For those of you that are unfamiliar with this concept, 100-day plans are a best practice of new leaders as they transition into their roles. They're not meant to fix everything, but to set a clear and bold direction while delivering near-term tangible results. The 100-day plan period ended in March, but the work continues to transform the way Toma leaders operate, to change how Toma treats our veteran patients, and rebuild trust with veterans, employees, and the community. Thanks to this ambitious plan and the dedication of caring frontline staff, Toma once a symbol of the overuse of opioids, is actually on its way to becoming a model for change in best practices. Let me highlight some of the great work by Vicki and the staff. In April, Toma completed more than 98% of their appointments within 30 days. In fact, nearly 17,000 appointments were completed in April. Of all of those, 217 were over 30 days from the day that the veteran wished to be seen. Their wait times are consistently among the best in all of EA. For primary care, less than three days. Specialty care, less than six days. And for mental health, a little more than two days. Vicki and the team are working to restore trust among veterans. She's opening lines of communication with our veterans by opening her door, meeting with countless veterans these past months. Other continuing efforts include developing an academic detailing team to review the medical center's most complex chronic pain patients and provide additional recommendations for their care. To support this initiative, more than 30 primary care and mental health providers attended academic detailing educational sessions in the month of March. She's also creating a veteran pain school to assess and customize alternative pain management strategies for veterans. Importantly, Toma has reduced the number of veterans receiving opioids by nearly one-fourth. Toma partners with the Wisconsin State Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, a program designed to ensure veterans are not obtaining opioid medications from multiple providers. Another step forward is the effective use of VA's audit tool, which allows doctors to improve practice and safety by seeing all the medications veterans are taking on a single dashboard. Vicki's made overdose education and naloxone rescue kits available to patients at risk of accidental or intentional overdose. Naloxone has proven effective in reversing an opioid overdose. Simply put, she's finding options, alternatives, and solutions other than just a bag of pills. Let me tell you about one of Toma's best practices. Evidence shows that the best outcomes in pain management occur with a comprehensive approach across multiple disciplines, with the patient as the central focus. This empowers the veteran to be an active participant in decision-making regarding pain care options. Toma developed the Integrated Pain University, which is strongly based on patient education and empowerment. This whole health perspective identifies and addresses biological, psychological, and social aspects of pain management in conjunction with assessment by the patient-aligned care team and any necessary specialty consults. Additionally, veterans receive information through a variety of elective classes taught by their respective healthcare professions, which include pain medications, pain nutrition, pain and sleep, 
aromatherapy, mindfulness, the neuroscience of pain, the introduction to movement, staying motivated, and spirituality. The result of these and other efforts as of the second quarter of fiscal year 2016, just over 9% of veterans at Toma are prescribed some form of opioid across the entire country, across all of VA's population, that national rate is nearly 13%. Vicki and the team are also listening. They're listening to veterans, to the community, and to employees. Listening led to the development of the Toma VAMC Veterans Experience Council and the Strategic Partnership Committee. The Veterans Experience Council will help make sure that Toma leaders have a clear understanding of how veterans perceive VA, while the Strategic Partnership Committee will work to strengthen and promote a unified approach to veteran care throughout the community. Vicki's hosted more than 15 employee listening sessions covering all work shifts at the medical center. These listening sessions are critical in getting a sense of how staff can better serve veterans while using input from these sessions to improve, to improve employee engagement, making sure employees are satisfied with their work environment. Monthly staff meetings, quarterly nurse town halls, and roundings with local union officers are all part of the larger efforts of our commitment to employees. As a result of these and many other actions, we're seeing Toma's performance improve as measured both internally and by veterans themselves. By understanding the challenges and taking ownership of the problems, Vicki and the leadership team are improving the organizational culture and climate, providing more oversight, effective oversight of care delivery, and addressing problems and prescribing practices. While there's more work to be done, while there is more work to be done, this strategic direction has led to a real positive change. Vicki's modeling effective leadership by taking ownership and accepting accountability of past mistakes in order to make tangible progress in caring for our nation's veterans. Bob McDonald and I talk a lot about sustainable accountability, making sure employees understand our mission, values, and strategy. It's accountability that results in positive veteran outcomes, not just in the very near term, but over the long term as well. And I believe that's what we're seeing here at Toma. Across all of VA, our work to change prescribing practices and develop alternative approaches to pain management is delivering steady progress. We've also developed a predictive model and a clinical decision support tool to identify patients being treated with opioids who may be at risk of suicide-related events or overdose. The stratification tool for opioid risk mitigation estimates the likelihood of an overdose or suicide event in the next year, providing patient-tailored recommendations for risk mitigation and non-opioid pain management options. Lessons learned have taught us that greater engagement improves lives. We're also getting unwanted drugs out of veterans' hands. Removal of veterans' unwanted and unneeded medications reduces the risk of diversion, as well as intentional or unintentional overdose, overdose or poisonings. As of May 1st, approximately 27,000 pounds of unwanted and unneeded medication have been collected and destroyed in an environmentally responsible manner. The overuse and misuse of opioids is a national problem, not just a VA problem. What we're doing here at Toman across VA is part of a broader national effort to fight opiate addiction and overprescribing of powerful drugs. Our hope is that VA's efforts here and elsewhere will become part of a national approach that will benefit not just veterans, but all Americans. We still have work to do. With your support and the support of many others, we will succeed. The needs of veterans can't be secondary to other agendas. It's unacceptable to VA leadership and should be unacceptable to anyone claiming to care about our nation's veterans. I need your help to change the dialogue and the perception of this facility in order to get the right people interested in these jobs. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your committee's support in identifying and resolving challenges here at Toma. And we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Our next witness is Mr. Michael Missel. Mr. Missile is the Inspector General for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Is this on? I think so. Uh, I, I had the privilege of going on the Senate floor and asking unanimous consent to have you confirmed. I know Senator Baldwin and a number of us were, were calling for a permanent Inspector General, and we're glad we have one. Uh, Mr. Missile is accompanied by Dr. John Day, Assistant Inspector General for the Health Care Inspections within the VA Office of Inspector General. Uh, Inspector General Missile. Thank you. Chairman Johnson, Senator Baldwin. Congress. Get, get it closer. How's that? Chairman Johnson, Senator Baldwin, Congressman Klein, and Congressman Walls. 
Thank you for the opportunity to appear today regarding the Office of Inspector General's past inspections of the Toma VA Medical Center and our work in the areas of pain management and opioid use. I am accompanied by Dr. David Day, Assistant Inspector General for Healthcare Inspections. He is a retired Army Colonel and spent over 25 years providing health care to soldiers. First, on a personal note, I want to thank all veterans for their great and selfless service to our nation. In addition, I want to express my sympathies to the families of those impacted by events at Toma. All of us at the OIG need to take these experiences and use them to improve VA's operations. Finally, as the son of a World War II veteran, I had a strong reminder of our mission's importance when I had the great honor of attending the replaying ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery yesterday. On May 2, 2016, I was sworn in as the Inspector General. Since then, I have immersed myself to understand the people, work, and goals of our office. I have, I have been impressed with the OIG staff, many of whom are veterans, and their focus on bringing about positive changes in the integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness of VA operations. While my integration has gone very well, I know there is much more to learn. I strongly advocate three overriding principles for our office. First, we must maintain our independence in all of our work, including avoiding the mere appearance of any undue outside influence. Second, we must be as transparent as possible while safeguarding the privacy of veterans, whistleblowers, and others. Third, we must produce work of the highest quality making sure it is accurate, timely, fair, objective, and thorough. During my first month, I've spent significant time reviewing our healthcare inspections of TOMA. I have also met with the Homeland Security staff on two occasions to ensure they have the necessary information about our work as it pertains to TOMA. My written statement contains a timeline of events related to the TOMA inspection closure, administrative closure, and I will not repeat it here. The inspection was administratively closed given the totality of the facts <coughs> identified at that time, specifically that the allegations could not be substantiated, the impact that disclosure of unsubstantiated allegations could have on an individual's reputation and privacy, and knowing our forthcoming 2014 national report would highlight many deficiency in VA providers' compliance with opioid prescribing guidelines. I would like to comment on the white paper about the TOMA inspection that was issued by my office on June 4, 2015. I do not agree with its tone or the gratuitous attacks on the reputation of individuals mentioned in it. It does not meet the high standards expected of our office. We have learned important lessons from this experience, including increasing the transparency of our work that should help us better meet our mission going forward. The changes made should increase the confidence that veterans, VSOs, Congress, and the public have in us. Subsequent to last year's hearing here, we released two additional inspections regarding TOMA. In June, we issued a report uh, with local and national recommendations focused on acute stroke treatment. And in August, we issued a report regarding the unexpected death of a patient during treatment at TOMA. This report had four recommendations. Notably, we recommended that the facility ensure clinicians comply with VHA policy regarding written informed consent when administering hazardous drugs. The issues associated with the use of op opioids to treat chronic pain and other conditions are a serious concern not just at TOMA, but throughout our nation. We continue to focus on VA's opioid prescription practices, publishing two reports on the topics earlier this year. That work identified many of the same issues reported in our May 2014 National Review. We found VA was not following its own policies and procedures in six key areas including follow-up evaluations of patients on take-home opioids, prescribing and dispensing of benzodiazepines concurrently with opioids, and routine and random urine drug tests prior to and during take-home opioid therapy. We note VA has taken actions to implement that report's recommendations, 
but they must monitor facility compliance with opioid prescription policies. Later this year, we expect to publish a wide-ranging national review of VA's pain management services, substance use treatment programs, use of non-VA treatments, opioid prescribing practices, and access to state prescription drug monitoring programs. Yesterday, our nation paid tribute to the sacrifices of those who gave their lives in our defense. It is a valuable reminder for us at the OIG to rededicate ourselves to ensuring that our work is independent, accurate, timely, fair, objective, and thorough. Dr. Day and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Inspector General Missile. Do we have a timer? Oh, there we go. What are we going to set that at, about seven minutes? Okay. Um, <coughs> Mr. Gibson, let me start with you. When did the problems here at Toma first hit your radar screen? When, when did you first hear about them? And, and you've been in the VA how long? Uh, I've been at VA for uh, two years and three months, two years and four months, right around there. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go from broad recollection because I didn't go back to check the record. I'm going to say probably sometime around January. Okay, when, when the uh, news 15. story broke, basically. Yes, that's correct. So in your experience with the VA, what, is the, what was, during that time frame, what was the attitude of the VA, the, the main department, with the Office of Inspector General? Uh, I, I would tell you, uh, coming into the organization, um, I've always viewed, whether it's called an IG or some other entity, an auditor, that having a uh, Having a, a working relationship, a constructive relation, all relationship, albeit recognizing their independence, uh, is vital. Because at the end of the day, we're after the same thing. Um, uh, I worked to try to create that kind of relationship. Um, uh, I, I always find it amusing when, when folks suggest that the IG has been management's lapdog. Because if you go look, they, they issue uh, over 300 reports a year, which means we're getting wire brushed about six times a week, every single week. And you scan, you scan the array of IG reports, and you'll find that, uh, that there's there's no uh, there's no pandering to VA interests there. It's very strong and independent entity. This this committee's you know does a lot of work with different inspector generals. We see kind of a spectrum, quite honestly. Sure, you do. Um, as ranking member of a subcommittee of this committee, uh, we, we uncovered the corruption within the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security, and Charles Edwards basically moved on ahead of our head of the posse. Uh, so we've seen the lack of independence. Yes. Um, what I thought was quite shocking as we got involved in this situation is that the Office of Inspector General had 140 <coughs> reports on investigations and inspections that it buried that it covered up, it did not make public. Now, I, I've mentioned that to other inspectors generals, and I asked them, how many reports have you not made public? And they really look at me like I'm from some other planet. I think I've had one inspector general say, well, there was one we didn't publish because of concerns about national security. Uh, so do you think it's appropriate that there were 140, now there's, by the way, another 70 reports on different wait time problems that apparently now the, the Office of Inspector General is starting to produce on a rolling basis, but I mean, that's a shocking number of reports on investigations and inspections from an independent, transparent office that were not made public. What, do, what, what's your take on that? Well, and I, I, my take is that, in general, they should be made public, and I think that's the stance that the IG has taken. I, you know, it's, uh, there, there, are, there have been instances where uh, this Office of Inspector General has identified things in the course of their investigation that weren't related to what they were seeking to uh, look into, where they have come to me specifically to say, you need to know about this, and where we've taken appropriate actions in the wake of that. That's, that's the kind, I think, frankly, part of what you see here, and I wasn't here four years ago, so I can't talk about knowledgeably about what, what was or was not the environment and the, and the practice, but I would tell you over my two plus years here, that the IG's been willing to bring things to me, and I think it's a much more principled base uh, view. I think some of this, uh, we get we get wrapped up in the rules, 
and we get so wrapped up in the rules, we lose sight of the principles. And, and so here's a case where I think, quite frankly, this is my view from the outside looking in, where we got, we got focused on the rules, when the rules basically said, this is what we're here to investigate. And, and, and we didn't step back and look more broadly at principles. And I think the IG has demonstrated the, the willingness and the ability to do that in subsequent events. I don't know whether they learned from this particular instance or from others, but I think that's, that's what we owe veterans. And, and, and I'm gonna go back and say, notwithstanding anything else, this is a leadership failure. There, there's there are lots, of, lots of finger pointing and, and everything else. At the end of the day, we own this. VA leadership owns this. Uh, we had ample opportunity over a period of years to fix this. That's leadership's responsibility, yeah, and I we failed to get it done. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Day, you, you were part of the uh, inspection team uh, for Toma, correct? Yeah, that's correct. One of the, one of the things that comes across in our, in our report is the confusion over what is the standard for substantiating a claim. Uh, for example, uh, it, this, in so many instances, this wasn't he said, she said, which, again, I've been in business, I've, I've had these employee situations where it's kind of difficult when it's he said, she said. This is a case with Dr. Houlihan where it was he said, they said. I mean, there was so much corroboration of the allegations. Uh, how did you come to the conclusion that so many of these charges were unsubstantiated? What, what is the standard? Maybe what I could do is go through the allegations one by one and we could talk about them <coughs> in that well, let's way. Let's, let's talk about, why don't we talk about the allegations of a climate of fear, a culture of fear within the, I mean, there were so many reports and it was so obvious that Dr. Houlihan, according to testimony, was a bully and created that and retaliated and, f and there were people fired as a result. And Chris Kirkpatrick committed suicide after he was fired. I mean, there was so, so much accumulated evidence. How could that not be substantiated? So we did to substantiate that there was uh, an issue between the, with a relationship between the chief of staff and the pharmacist primarily. And we transmitted that information to VHA. It was not a surprise. And um, the proof that we transmitted that and that it was not a surprise is at the end of our review, we sat down and talked with both the director of TOMA and the vision director. And they told us at the time that we were out briefing them of the changes they had made so that the chief of staff no longer supervised the pharmacist. They were aware of problems in the pharmacy and were working to try to correct them. So with respect to the relationship between the chief of staff and the pharmacist, our admin closure lays it out clearly that that was an issue. It wasn't, in my view, the primary problem that was addressed at TOMA. The primary problem was the allegation that TOMA providers were providing narcotics uh, outside the standard of care and that narcotics were being distributed in such a way the, the rules of law were being broken. We looked extensively to find out whether that was true or not. <coughs> Medical experts reviewed many charts. We reviewed many emails of 17 providers, at 17 individuals at VA looking for evidence of malfeasance. We worked with the TOMA police, the VA police, the DEA, multiple times looking for evidence of a problem evidence of criminality. Our investigators went undercover looking for evidence of criminality. So I'm left with the problem of their allegations, and I just don't have the facts to support many of those allegations. Well, I, I think most people reading our report will say there's a lot of substantiated uh, evidence to substantiate that charge. Just quick before I turn it over to Senator Baldwin, on page 270, uh, we have your signature on the administrative closure sheet. Um, every ounce of evidence that we can find shows that, that administrative closure occurred in August of 2014. Uh, I wa want everybody to take a look at two, page 270. It completely looks like this has been doctored from 8-12-14 to 3-12-14. It, it has not been doctored. The, so what, 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 what further evidence other than this, what looks, appears to be a doctored <coughs> signature, 
what other evidence would indicate that you close this out in, in March versus August? The, there, so when uh, information flows, if well, I would sign a document as I signed this one, and unfortunately in the admin closures, we, we, uh, they come to my desk, I sign them and I write a date on them. So is, is that normally how you write a three? It, it with an eight kind of, you know, kind of embodied within the three? <coughs> that's, that's, that's the signature, that's what I wrote at that time. Is, is there f any further evidence that this was actually initially closed in March of 2014? Because everything else shows that you administrative closed this in August. I don't know what you're talking about. The, the, the actual date, date that I signed the report, it then goes into other systems, which are systems of record, and it's entered into what we call a, a different computer system and that it was closed okay. at that time. I find this unbelievably puzzling, and I, I do want to get to the bottom of this. Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Uh, so I want to kind of start where uh, Senator Johnson left off with regard to this, this process on this administrative closure. So the report, a uh, committee report outlines a very long inspection, investigation. You use the words somewhat in interchangeably. Um, now, the work product after the inspection, the visits, the interviews, et cetera, um, seems to have gone through a number of iterations prior to there being a decision to make this an administrative closure. Um, I know that, um, and you'll see this throughout the committee report, uh, frustrations expressed about documents that were requested from the Inspector General but were not granted to the, the committee. Um, but we had an opportunity granted by uh, the IG's office in the last couple of weeks to inspect the draft reports. Um, couldn't take notes, couldn't, and I didn't do it, but my, my staff went in uh, to see them. And so th the committee has reviewed some of the drafts prepared during the Toma investigation. And I was disturbed to learn after I was briefed that things that the IG staff was aware of didn't make it into the final administrative closure. For example, one case study referenced in an IG draft report explained that Dr. Houlihan had increased one patient's dosage of oxycodone more than eightfold in one year and that there was not always a rationale noted in the chart. During the same time frame, this patient had nine refills of a Schedule II controlled substance dispensed more than a week early. Probably more disturbing, the case study explained, and I'm <coughs> paraphrasing because there is not copies uh, available, um, that Dr. Houlihan miscalculated the number of pills prescribed to the patient and that Dr. Houlihan made up for the shortage by refilling the prescription early. Can, can you explain to me why details um, of these case studies referenced in the draft report didn't make it into the final administrative closure? The, um, my instruction to the staff was because the final, because the draft report did not substantiate the, what I thought were the significant allegations that we were looking at. I asked them then to write an administrative closure. So the same people that wrote the draft report wrote the administrative closure. There were no instructions as to what to put in or what to put out. If you'll take a look at the 140 administrative closures that we had done previously, and I'll say that um, the, uh, there was my understanding in our practice that if I took a hotline, I would either publish it to the web or I would note in the SAR, the semi-annual report to the, to the Congress, that we had an administrative closure. So they were, in my view, made public there, although <coughs> albeit not with very much detail. Some years there was a lot of detail, some years there was not. But I asked them to write an administrative closure. So they chose, for I don't know what reason, to shorten it up, and, and it was, I don't know, 14 pages for the admin closure. Most of the 140, 11 pages, most of the 
and then closures that we published were one or two pages. So they were trying to put in the detail they thought was relevant. Well, I mean, on that, in the administrative closure, you did note that patients requested early refills. <coughs> the document does not state that Dr. Houlihan wrote in <coughs> files that he miscalculated the prescriptions and made <coughs> up for the shortages by refilling the prescriptions. And to me, this tells a different story. Um, there's also no mention that he did not always provide a rationale in the charts for substantially increasing already high prescriptions, like the example I just mentioned. So we, we gathered um, in March of 2015 this, uh, the, the Senate um, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, and you testified. Um, you testified that staff at TOMA were, quote, at the outer boundary of acceptable prescribing practices, end quote. And this statement seems to imply to me that um, there may have been some unusual practices happening at the trauma facility and within the facility's leadership. So is the example I just raised the type of thing that was on the outer boundary of acceptable prescribing practices, or is it beyond that boundary? I would say that our view was that in summary, he was at the outer boundary, and the facts that you describe would be, in my view, probably over the outer boundary. But we thought that the totality of the care provided was, was at the outer boundary. Um, Inspector uh, General Missile, um, I know you're new to this position, um, but you've read this uh, committee report, and I guess I want to know your opinion on putting um, putting out a policy that outlines what the standard ought to be in your agency for substantiating or unsubstantiating allegations. Um, at least for cases like this where you think it might be a close call or right outside those boundaries. Yes, well, I've, I've looked at that. I've had the opportunity to review um, the report. Uh, standard, uh, it, it's, it's a complicated issue. For instance, with respect to investigations, when we're doing an investigation, did somebody do something? The standard to me is preponderance of the evidence. Is it more likely than not that somebody did it? When you come into healthcare inspections, you're looking at the quality of care which is a far more complicated area. And it really depends on a variety of things of what you're looking at, you know, what the literature says, what experts may say, et cetera. But I understand the point. I know it was a, a significant issue, and we intend to look very closely at that and to talk about standard of care and, and the uh, uh, standards that we're going to be using going forward. So we will be doing that. Well, with the advantage of hindsight, this doesn't look all that complicated to me. We're going to look at that very closely. I mean, Senator Baldwin, what is amazing is they had a pretty high standard for <coughs> substantiating the claim in their OIG report, and yet with the white paper, they had no problem rushing out a, a report that really threw whistleblowers and, and individuals under the bus. It's really quite remarkable. I also appreciate the fact that you were talking about the frustration this committee's had in obtaining the information. I just want to refer everybody to page 324. This is what one of the documents looks like provided by the Office of Inspector General, who yet has not yet <laughs> complied with our full subpoena. I mean, I mean think about that. We had to this committee had to subpoena the Office of Inspector General to get the information, and now 16 months later, well, it's really about a, a year later, because we issued the subpoena at the end of April, still has not complied. So, Mr. Missile, again, we look forward to working with you on that. Uh, I do want to welcome Representative Kine and Representative Walsh from Minnesota. We'll not hold that against you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Congressman Kine. Well, thank you, Senator. And I want to thank you, too, for uh, yours and the committee's <coughs> invitation for me and Representative Walsh to uh, participate in today's hearing. Uh, yesterday, many of us were at a Memorial Day uh, commemoration events. And during it, it's a sober reminder of not only our obligation to honor our fallen heroes, but the unfinished work of making sure that our veterans, those who served our nation, are receiving the care and the treatment that they earned and that they deserve. 
And that's always been my guiding star throughout this whole process. Given the tragedy, given the mistakes that were made at Toma, which according to your testimony here today has not been unusual in regards to the VA medical uh, system throughout the nation, um, if we keep our focus on the veterans uh, and making sure that that is our true guiding star, then hopefully we can bring some good out of the tragedy. And I know that is exactly what has been motivating the Simkowski family this whole time. I, I've been proud and honored to be able to work with each one of them when it comes to fixing the problem to ensure that no veteran in the future goes through what that family has done. Jason's wife, Heather, and his parents, Linda and Marv, have been intimately involved in not only providing feedback on the legislation we've been working on to honor his legacy, the Jason Simkowski Promise Act, but they've even taken the extra step of making phone calls to appropriate committee members, even to Speaker Ryan, about the importance and the urgency of getting this legislation done and implemented as quickly as possible. In fact, Heather and uh, Linda and, and Heather's daughter and Naya were just out in Washington a couple of weeks ago to, to make some last minute visits, but also to personally witness the passage of the Jason Simkowski Promise Act unanimously on the House floor. And we look forward to working with this committee and uh, you senators uh, in order to ensure that this reaches the president's desk so we can get this done and implement it as, as quickly as possible. Uh, Heather today asked if I'd be willing to uh, read a short two paragraph statement you know, for the record and I'd ask unanimous consent to do so at this time. Uh, she writes and I quote, it is encouraging to see the congressional delegation working together in honor of Jason to ensure no other families go through what we had to endure. We are proud of the progress made so far in passing legislation named after Jason. We look forward to working with the congressional delegation to make sure the legislation becomes law. We are grateful for an opportunity to see everyone come together to turn such tragedy into something that has the potential to save so many lives in the future. As we continue moving forward, we are committed to remaining focused on the bipartisan support for this legislation. Clearly the job's not done yet, but I do want to commend Director, Acting Director Vicki Brom, uh, the work that has been, the progress that has been made at Toma. This comes on the heels of the work that then Acting Director John Rohr, when he came in and inherited uh, the challenge that existed and what they're trying to build on right now, the community outreach, uh, working with the staff on best practices, uh, but especially listening to the families and to the veterans themselves and making sure that they have input and a say and what is taking place there. I think it's important that we stay focused uh, in that endeavor. But I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the, the good work that has been done at Toma. I, I've been somewhat surprised by the number of veterans who have gone out of their way to personally notify me that the, how happy they are of the care and treatment that they have received at Toma. And my guess is this would be fairly consistent around the country too. So although there were serious allegations and mistakes made, I don't think we should overlook uh, a lot of the dedication, a lot of the professionalism, a lot of the compassion that is taking place at places like Toma each and every day. And sometimes, given the sensation of these stories and what the media tends to focus on, that gets lost in kind of the fog of everything that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but Mr. Mines, well, while we have you here and we know you're new to the position and it's been raised already by the senators, uh, we did have some communication problems with the IG's office when it comes to conducting the investigation proper notification. I know that when I had received an anonymous letter back in September of 2013, I, or 2011, I immediately forwarded that on to the OIG's office asking them to look into it and conduct an investigation. Received notification that they were going to do that uh, and that we'd be notified uh, at the end of that investigation. Now listen, I'm a former special prosecutor and I've been involved in a lot of investigations myself. Y you don't know when you go into an investigation how long it's going to take, how complex it's going to be. You talk to one witness and suddenly Ten more names uh, appear. I, I get all of that. But what was problematic to me and to the committees of jurisdiction was the lack of notification when, when the IG's office administratively closed it with certain reforms and changes that had to be made and we were operating in the dark because there was no notification uh, given. And I also want to you know, commend Representative Walls who serves on the committee for, for the work that he's done. Uh, he's been a good partner through all of this. Uh, along with Gus Bilirakis, uh, a real bipartisan effort, but we're only as good as the information that's given to us. And Dr. Day, when the report did come out, uh, and I later found out that we weren't notified, I called you and others that were involved in the investigation into my office immediately to get clarification on what was taking place. To your credit, 
you guys owned up that it, the ball had been dropped, notification wasn't given when the intent was. I know this was coming at the time of Phoenix and other news stories that were breaking uh, at the time. But in light of all that, I introduced legislation, the Inspector General Transparency Act, which I'm glad the report was included in the year-end budget last year, which now requires that notification. So, Mr. Meisel, on that point specifically, is that going to help uh, in your mind as far as the lines of communication, keeping policymakers informed of what changes and reforms have to be made so we can be working together and in tandem to make sure that this gets done? Yes, I, I think it will help, but hopefully we don't need legislation to become more transparent. Uh, my goal is to communicate with the public, with Congress, with the department on issues that they need to. Uh, there were a number of mistakes made by my office at the time, and uh, we agree that one of the mistakes was not keeping Congress better informed on this issue, and I'm going to work very hard to make sure that does not happen again. Mr. Gibson, you know, I, I appreciate your testimony written in your oral testimony today about the need to continue on a more coordinated, integrated, veteran-focused health care delivery system. I think a lot of ways the, the, the VA system throughout the country has been good in driving that, that goal, that momentum in that direction, but clearly more work needs to be done. Is there yes. any other things that Congress needs to be working with the VA right now to make sure that you're given the, the policy prescription, but also the tools and resources in order to in order to get this accomplished. Um, I, I appreciate the request and I appreciate your, your recognizing the good work that goes on every day because you're right, it doesn't get reported. It doesn't diminish the, the challenges that we have, but it's part of the context. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, and uh, we've been working really with both of our authorizing committees on an array of legislative uh, priorities that we have. Um, uh, many of which get at some of these very issues. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, most immediately of the request to make all of our medical center directors and network directors Title 38. Uh, quite frankly, if I had that authority in my hip pocket right now, the lady sitting behind me would already be the medical center director here. And, and so um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for uh, uh, committing a prohibited personnel <laughs> practice for having said that. but. <laughs> You know, she's doing awesome work, and she's the kind of person and having the kind of uh, ability to, to direct hire and, and a little flexibility around compensation would make that possible among, among a large number of other uh, priorities that we've identified. Thank you for asking, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Walls. Thank you, Senator Johnson, uh, for, uh, for including me in this hearing. And the past one, uh, Senator Baldwin and Kind, uh, for all three of you, the work that you do, I. I'm Tim Walls. I represent Minnesota's uh, first congressional district that's just a little bit west of here across the river and then all the way out to South Dakota. And that river may separate us on football loyalty, but it doesn't separate us as Americans. And uh, many of my constituents uh, use this facility. Uh, also, uh, prior to being in Congress, I spent 24 years as an artilleryman and retired as a command sergeant major. And spent the last 10 years on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, so I spent the last 35 years uh, not just talking about veterans issues, but, but being part of that. And, and I can tell you this, that as a member of Congress, the security of this nation and the care of our warriors is our number one priority. That's also the number one priority of all of you sitting out there and every constituent in my district and Ron's district and across Wisconsin and Minnesota. It's also the number one priority of these folks sitting up here. Um, and uh, you don't just get in this and leave. Uh, for example, Mr. Gibson, if some of you do not know, my capacity of working with him prior to his <coughs> current position was he ran the USO, a fabulous organization of care for our warriors, which he did with uh, grace, skill, effectiveness. And, and I think for all of us, trying to find uh, solutions to the best care possible is what we're here for. So I appreciate all of you coming out on a a day like this, and to the family you heard it. And I think that's the thing that always uh, most strikes me. In the midst of heart-wrenching tragedy that I will not even attempt to understand, a family seeking justice, which they deserve and we should deliver, but also transferring that into solutions to make sure no other family goes through it too, whether they meet them or not. And that is a very powerful call to action for us. So I look at it as our responsibility is to give them the justice find out what went wrong, find out who's responsible, and hold them accountable, but simultaneously making sure that the changes that are being made 
don't happen. And for some of you to think on this is, there really is nothing new under the sun. I think about this and uh, folks up here and Ron and I talked about this and worked together on first two things that I was able to do when I got to Congress that actually became put into law and affected was first increasing the budget for the VA Inspector General, which at that time was incredibly low and you simply did not have enough people to go out. We would send in requests and you'd say, I don't have people to cover this and we couldn't find those eyes on it. And secondly was passing uh, step pain management uh, on opioid reduction. 2007, people were already thinking about that, not just me, but the folks up here and the folks that understood this of trying to implement that. And I guess for me, it, we made a good effort and I think the VA and, and Mr. Gibson is right. This is an issue that is, uh, is systemic to our entire culture and, and it is a huge problem. Now you hear lots of people talking about it. That is great. But there are solutions out there. We need to implement them and move them forward. And uh, I know the, the bill that I passed went from 2009 to 2014, we were only able to implement 31% of it by the time it expired in terms of doing this. And this is best practices that are out there. So I think today in the time that we're going to have here today, uh, I'm going to attempt to try and focus on what's changed at DOMA. Uh, and, and trust me on this, uh, Mr. Houlihan or anyone else involved in this, justice needs to be served. And we will find that. Senator Johnson will continue to do that, Senator Baldwin. Um, as a member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, I want to know what you've done to make a difference. What happens with my veterans from Houston County who come over to Toma now and what's changed? And with my remaining time, I'm going to start on a, a line of questioning on this is, and Mr. Gibson, maybe you can help me with this. How do I know things are better at Toma? How do I know if someone asks me, is it better at Toma or is it the same thing that happened when the reputation that, that started this was there? I think some of the uh, some of the, the activities that I described earlier that Vicki's been engaging in, the open door with veterans, the outreach into the community, uh, looking for ways that we, we, we bring the community together to, to help support our veterans. You know, one of the things that we've started doing recently, because access is such a critical issue for us, is we, we've started uh, at our kiosks ask, asking the very one very simple question, how satisfied were you that you got today's appointment when you wanted it? Uh, at TOMA, the answer is 93% satisfied or completely satisfied. Um, it, it is, uh, they are doing so many things so well. You can look at, you can look at the sale data. Uh, many of you may not realize VA leads the country, perhaps the world, in reducing healthcare associated infections. Healthcare associated infections, second leading cause of death in America, more than automobile accidents right. and breast cancer combined. And when, and when and external studies went and looked who was, who was doing this better than any other organization, it wasn't the Cleveland Clinic, it wasn't Kaiser Permanente, it wasn't Geisinger, it was VA. Not even Mayo. Guess who, guess who leads VA? Toma in minimizing healthcare associated infections. I would tell you the number one area where they've got work to do is in employee uh, satisfaction and employee engagement, and that's the culture problem. And that's why leadership matters so much. Uh, so, I, you know, veterans are telling us, you're hearing from veterans that are saying, I've heard from veterans here, and I would tell you, my, my classmate was a patient here in the CLC for 23 years. And the family in his obituary said, the staff here made them feel like they were part of their family. Uh, that's, that's what's happening with so many of the Wisconsinites that are working right here caring for our veterans is they're doing the right thing, but we didn't have the right leadership in place, and I think, I think we got a good clue. Well, we the right need to give them the tools because the yes, they, we, we do. owe them nothing less you hear that, yes. but as equally important as holding accountable and if it's firing or whatever needs to be done for those people, we need to have the ability, as you said, and I'm with you on the Title 38, we need to be able to hire the best and possible because we can't yes. fire a way to a fix, but we can simultaneously get rid of the bad and bring in the good. You got and it. I yield back. You got it. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman Walls. Um, let, let me continue down that vein uh, about accountability. Uh, in 2015, I introduced the Ensuring Veteran Safety Through Accountability Act, and I testified with uh, Senator Baldwin when she introduced the Jason Kuski, Kuski uh, uh, 
Dallas, forget the, the full names, but the Opiate Safety Act. At the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I was more than disappointed when the representatives from the VA testified against the Accountability Act. Now, fortunately, a similar provision uh, introduced by Marco Rubio, which I co-sponsored, was passed by the VA committee. But having been in business for 30-some years, I mean, I understand that probably the most corrosive thing to any organization is not being able to hold the bad actors accountable. And yet here you have the v representatives of the VA saying, now nah, we really don't want that authority to hold people accountable. I mean, that's at the heart. I mean, I agree with you. I think all of us here agree with you. As, as we tour around and we talk to the doctors and nurses, and I send my opening statement, they do an extraordinary job. They're really concerned. But unless we really have the ability to hold people accountable, that's what causes these types of tragedies. So is that something that the VA will now embrace, the ability to actually discipline and terminate and hold people accountable within the VA system? Uh, I, would, I would say the answer is an unequivocal yes. Um, Good. That has been, that we'll is, move on. well, that has been, <laughs> that has been part of my own personal obligation as a leader since I first got to VA. I, I'm, I'm the guy that takes action on senior leaders in the department. I'm the guy that issued the removal on DeSanctus, and I'm the guy that looks at other instances what, of particular notoriety to ensure that we're taking the appropriate action. Good. Well, we want to give you that authority because you have to have it. Uh, another piece of uh, legislation I introduced was the Dr. Kirk Kirk, Kirk, uh, Chris Kirkpatrick, uh, let me give you the full title of that one as well. The Christopher, Christopher Kirkpatrick Whistleblower Protection Act. And this was really prompted by a committee hearing we had where Sean Kirkpatrick testified before our committee. And one thing that I've been literally shocked by, again, coming from the private sector, uh, even though we have all these whistleblower protection laws on the books for 100 years, the level of retaliation against those people that have the courage to come forward, like Dr. Noel Johnson, like Ryan Honnell, like Chris Kirkpatrick, is jaw-dropping. Uh, so again, I, I hope that the VA will embrace and help support the passage of that piece of legislation to give those whistleblowers the protection they really need. And by the way, I would announce again that uh, my committee has set up the whistleblower hotline. It's just whistleblower at ronjohnson.senate.gov. Uh, people are using that, and I think it's also an important step that's required so that whistleblowers within the VA, by, and by the way, the, the highest level of retaliation, according to the Office of Special Counsel, is, is within the Veterans Administration, which is a real problem. So again, w will you support the, the Christopher Kirkpatrick Whistleblower Act? I, I don't know what's in the act, and, and I also don't know what's in the accountability legislation you referred to earlier. What I will tell you is that I, I personally, as the acting secretary, met with Carolyn uh, Lerner, the, the special counsel of the United States. I committed to VA becoming certified, the first large federal department that became certified uh, as a whistleblower protecting organization. I have publicly uh, uh, recognized and, uh, uh, and presented awards to whistleblowers. Uh, I meet with whistleblowers at every location where I go visit. When I came to, to this location last year, I met with Ryan Honnell. I do that. Uh, you know, coming out of the private sector, I understand that your most valuable source of information on how to do things better are your frontline employees. The last thing you want are people that are afraid to raise their hand. So everything we're doing as an organization has to do with creating that kind of culture. Uh, a little bit along the lines of what uh, Mike said earlier, I, I don't need a law to tell me to do that. That's back to just good leadership, not necessarily from me, but from people across the department. Good. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Day, as I'm going through the committee's report, and you see that the first hotline uh, notice really was about March 2011, and for whatever reason, it wasn't didn't rise to the level, and then in August, 2011, partly because of uh, Representative Kine's inquiry, so it all of a sudden became a congressional hotline, or a congressional inquiry, uh, gained a little steam and got the notice. But it took till 2014 to send, you know, complete this uh, in inspection, investigation, and then issue some kind of report. There's an awful lot of activity. I think the first site visit was in 2012, and not a whole lot happened in 2013 into whenever, whatever date it actually was closed. What was happening during that point in time? 
Well, let me first set the record straight on the issue of the date at the bottom of the report. That date is accurate. And if you'll look at the emails which transmit the PDF of the report I signed, you'll find that those dates are consistent with the date okay, I signed. Okay, good. It. So we got great. So appreciate that's that. That's absolutely the truth. And I believe that data may be in your hands now. I'm not absolutely sure how many of the thousands of records we gave you you have. Um, the problem with this uh, uh, Toma allegation was we got a letter that was uh, very early on that laid out a whole series of cases which alleged that there was horrible care provided. And unfortunately, I received many more allegations than I have the resources to <coughs> investigate or inspect. So with that letter, we read it. Uh, I didn't have the resources at the date that came in, and so I sent it to VHA. I usually send it to one level above, so it would go to the VISN. And the VISN wrote us back a letter with each of the cases outlining how the quality of care had been appropriate. So we read that letter, and we said, okay, this makes sense. We'll, we'll say that, that th we'll, we'll, we'll close this at this point in time. As part of the CAP process, we have an employee survey where we ask employees what their view of the world is with respect to quality of care at a facility. And we did a CAP about that time, and a number of TOMA employees indicated that there were concerns about medication abuse at TOMA. We had that fact. We got a letter from Senator Kine, excuse me, Representative Kine, Congressman Kine, saying there was an issue. So we said, okay. We need to go out to Toma and figure out whether th what the real story is. And so that launched our review. Um, I sent a team out there, as you note, and we talked to the, we, we made calls before. We got all the data we could ahead of time. We went out there, and the allegations continued to increase. We, I think the admin closure lists 32 or 33 different allegations. So as the allegations increase, you, you go down more and more <coughs> tracks. And, and as we would go down a track, unfortunately, we got a lot of dead ends. People would say a, a, a certain transaction had occurred at a certain place. We couldn't find any data for that. We couldn't find evidence for that. So um, we uh, decided then that what we needed to do was to pull all the emails for employees that worked there for a certain period of time. So, it, so you have to stop and say, okay, let's go get the emails. We got an email poll. It was insufficient the first time. And we had to go actually to their computers and pull the email off their computers and get that back. And you have to read that email. Uh, we were in continuous conversation with uh, the, uh, the, not the FBI, but the uh, DEA, uh, trying to understand where they were or did they have any issues with this. Um, I then met with our agents, 51 group, the, the investiga investigators. Uh, they agreed to go on site, so they went on site and did work. Um, so it took a long time if you have a relatively small number of people and you have <laughs> allegations that explode to run down each of these and, tracks. And, and, and yet, and I appreciate it, but and yet, the VA, when they undertook their own investigation together with this committee, in just a couple months, pretty well substantiated the, the charges and started holding people accountable. So I think, I think for me the important question is whether or not VA was aware as we were doing our work of what we were finding, and were, were they aware that there were issues at Toma? And I believe that they were at the local level, the Vision level, and at the at Baco aware that there were issues at Toma that needed to be addressed, and that we were in communication with them. Not every fact was presented to them until we were able to assemble the facts and put them out there and lay them out for everyone to see clearly. But, uh, I would argue that the responsibility of the Inspector General is to make that information public and also make sure that something is done about it. So and that, that didn't happen. I'm out of time here, yes Senator sir. Baldwin. On the issue of accountability, um, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Gibson. Uh, Dr. Houlihan was fired from the VA and at the time that he was fired, I wrote to uh, the VA to ensure that veterans would not ultimately be referred to his practice 
outside the VA through the Veterans Choice Program. Uh, subsequently, through public reports, his license was suspended by the state of Wisconsin, and I received a letter back from the VA indicating that he would not be eligible to serve veterans under the CHOICE program because his license was suspended. Um, you may or may not be aware, again, through public reporting, uh, it appears that an administrative law judge has um, reinstated his license during the pendency of proceedings before the state. And so I want to, first of all, get assurances from you that uh, in light of that new development, that Dr. Houlihan would not be getting referrals <coughs> of veterans through the Veterans Choice Program. Absolutely not. And so, Senator Baldwin, if I can just quick interrupt, because that's an incredibly important point you're making. That administrative law judge is citing the white paper. So, Inspector General Missile, can you, would you repudiate that so that that can no longer be used by the administrative law judge, that white paper? Yep. My office um, uh, took the white paper off its website, so to me that means it no longer is a, a, a document of the Inspector General's office. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. So th this correspondence between me and the VA has highlighted for me that nothing in the VA choice legislation explicitly um, requires that somebody who is fired or suspended um, from the VA for cause related to their service, um, uh, you know, to our nation's veterans. Uh, there's nothing that explicitly addresses this in the law. And so I feel like this is a dangerous loophole that we currently have. Um, I've recently introduced bipartisan legislation um, that uh, just passed the Senate, although it has not made it all the way through the legislative process. That legislation requires the VA secretary to block a health care provider from participating in community programs if that provider was uh, fired or suspended from the VA, violated his or her medical license, or had a department certification revoked or otherwise broke the law. Um, Secretary Gibson, are there steps that the VA can take right now to ensure that this loophole isn't being exploited or taking advantage of by other providers other than the case that we're uh, talking about today? Uh, I have not discussed the matter specifically with the folks that are working uh, care in the community, but I will do so. Uh, there's no reason why we can't impose a po implement a policy that accomplishes the same thing without, uh, without the need for legislation. At the, during uh, our chairman's um, opening statement, he drew our attention to um, uh, portions of the committee report uh, discussing uh, the, um, the concern that two of the witnesses during the inspection were impaired, um, uh, possibly by drugs or alcohol. Um, it was a suspicion. There's a lot of discussion in the committee report on this. Um, I think disturbing was that um, the only two follow-up actions were uh, a um, doctor emailed the VA OIG's general counsel um, wanting to discuss a concern regarding possibly impaired interviewee or S at the end, interviewees. Um, and uh, subsequently an off-the-record discussion with the Toma VA's uh, director at the time, Mario DeSanctis. Um, there's no clear record of whether that tip was followed up on or not. Um, my question is, um, will the VA Office of Inspector General adopt new policies or procedures so that this happens in a future case, and of course we hope it never does, um, 
that the IG s suspects that a witness um, uh, employed by the VA is under the influence of a controlled substance, that there is a procedure that will be followed that would provide greater accountability and safety for our nation's veterans. Can I? Can I? I, I, I would I, like to hear both of you okay. on that, but, um, <laughs> but this was first uh, noticed by the team doing the inspection, and, uh, and so I want to hear what the Inspector General has to say about procedures if this should ever happen again, and then I'd like to hear from you, Deputy I'd Secretary. Love to, I'd love to share my two cents worth. Yes, ma'am. Um, with respect to my view on that, if, if I ever see a situation where I think somebody, particularly uh, somebody um, providing uh, health care to, to veterans uh, may be in a situation where they're impaired in one way, uh, I would immediately uh, make sure appropriate uh, people uh, within VHA or above that were aware of that and to follow up and to make sure um, that that situation uh, was resolved to our satisfaction as quickly as possible. And in this particular case, do you, do you have any knowledge that the committee doesn't about whether um, anything was followed up on by, uh, by Director DeSanctis? I do not have any more information. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you based upon my, first time I ever heard of this was reading it in the report. First time ever. This is a, we're right back to leadership. That is what this is about. This is about delivering safe care to veterans. And the failure of leadership that happened here was the failure on the part of the medical center director to take appropriate action. And everything that I, that I, issue, I mentioned earlier, I issued the removal on the medical center director. I, I reviewed hundreds and hundreds of pages of evidence. Uh, and I would tell you not doing something about this would be very consistent with the pattern of behavior that I saw there. It was a failure of leadership. Should not have happened. Period. And I don't need a policy or a rule to try to enforce that. We're back to principles. The principles here, you said, put the veteran at the center of everything that you're doing. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And understanding, making leadership in the organization understand the sense of urgency with which they must act. When something has been presented to them that, that suggests that, that, that the, the safety of the veteran, the care of the veteran may be at risk. That is an urgent situation. You have to act, and you have to act timely and promptly. That's what these folks have been doing. There was an instance that happened. Uh, these folks, and I'm not gonna, I won't get into the, the, to the great details, but here's the timeline. They became aware on the 19th of November, 2015, that there was misconduct. They launched a fact-finding the next day, the 20th of November, 2015, the fact finding was completed on the 7th of December and the proposed removal was issued on the 8th of December. That's the kind of timely action and follow up. That's what good leaders do. And that's what we've got to ensure we've got in place all across this department. Don't need more. a watchdog to tell us how to do our job. Important to have a good watchdog, but we don't need one to tell us how to do our job. Congressman Kine. One of the problems we had at Toma was chain of command. We had the chief of staff, in this case, Dr. Houlihan, who was also prescribing medication. And getting back to the team or coordinated approach to proper health care delivery, uh, there was a culture of intimidation yes. that was created by Dr. Houlihan that made it almost impossible for someone with a dissenting view or a dissenting opinion to come forward in order to change a certain treatment regimen. Yes. Has that been fixed now, not just in Toma, but throughout the, the VA medical system? Uh, I, I know it's been fixed here in Toma. Uh, I think the issue that's been raised here prompts a review across our organization to ensure that we've got um, appropriate separation of authority here. Uh, very early on, in fact, at the very beginning of the medical center director's tenure, the issue of separating re the reporting relationship for pharmacy was raised. The medical center director refused to do that until, I'm going to say, roughly a year and a half later when he finally got a new associate director in place. And we had problems in construction with VA, and, and the executive director responsible for that area was uh, encouraged to leave, and he did leave. 
I accepted direct re responsibility for construction and facilities management until such time as we got the leadership in place. That's precisely the kind of action that should have been taken here. Well, I think you know, that's the thing that probably made me the angriest of the information coming out, and probably for most people in this room, what was that culture of intimidation, the yes. bullying that was taking place, and good people trying to do the right thing, keeping the focus on the veterans were cut off. And in yes. one instance led to a suicide, other instances led to firing or people leaving their positions because of this culture that was created. And that I think it's just essential that we fix that throughout the entire system or we're going to have another hearing somewhere else in this country, I'm afraid, talking about the same set of facts. The day you and I were here at Toma last year together was the day that, that Houlihan was placed on administrative leave. I remember that. He had, been, he had been removed from clinical duties, but it became evident to me that he was still exerting undue influence on other providers in the organization. Yeah. And that was the day he was removed. Well, back to my original question, too. What more can Congress be doing working with you? I think in your written testimony you said we've got to adequately fund the OSC to make sure that there are resources to hire additional investigators. Do you still have that opinion today? I, I, I do. We, we work very closely and very collaboratively with, with the Office of Special Counsel. I would say uh, to my brethren uh, next to me here that there's probably an opportunity for, for the Office of Special Counsel and our IG to work more collaboratively, collaboratively together. Sometimes things have gotten in the way of that. But between our investigative uh, resources, their investigative resources, and the Office of Special Counsel's investigative resources, I think there's an opportunity for us to do better by taxpayers and better by veterans. Both. We'll be happy to follow up with you in regards yes, to sir. funding levels and that. But uh, And I know the VA and here at Toma are also exploring more alternative and complementary forms of medical treatment. Yes. So we're just not loading the vets up on a cocktail of prescription drugs and expecting that to solve all the problems. But there's also a danger of overreacting. And I've gotten some feedback from veterans that it's a little more difficult for them to get the prescription med, the opioids that they need for proper pain management. I, I, I know it's, it's a difficult balance, but how, how well are we doing on that front? Dr. West. Yeah, thank you for that question. And you bring up a very important point that you can't overreact, right? I mean, I'm a physician that still treats patients, you know, every week, uh, kind of in, in my own clinic, and I, you know, I kind of see it every 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 week. Um, forever, the the medical system as a whole, you know, including VA and, and our academic centers, was moving towards prescribing pills. You know, we found out that was wrong, and that that was actually killing people. Now we're turning a big aircraft carrier around, and the way we're doing it is through exactly what you mentioned, you know, complementary and alternative medicines. And there are other medicines to treat pain. You know, they're not just opiates. You know, there are uh, neuromodulating agents and new agents coming out all the time. So, you, you know, as a clinician, you have to be very sensitive to the patient and the individual case and really work through the patient's uh, I mean, this is all a, a, a veteran-centric, you know, work through, and it, it takes a long time. And you need things like this. This is a, a brilliant thing that they've come up with, Toma, to support frontline physicians in decision-making for patients, education for patients, and other treatments for patients that they can use for their pain. Uh, no, I would also encourage the VA to continue the efforts to provide a avenue or a line of communication for the family members themselves. I, I th still think they're the best line of defense in all this. They're going to know what's working and what isn't with the loved one in their oh. family. So making sure we foster that receptive environment for them. And finally, I, I, Mr. Gibson, looking at you, uh, we've got to get the message to the directors of all the VA medical centers that they have to be as candid and truthful and honest with us because many of us are visiting these campuses all the time. To, to check in on the veterans, find out what's working, what isn't working. I'm a, and I'm on at Toma. I'm up in the cities. Uh, I try to get down to Madison, too, and I, I'm always asking, what do I need to be aware of? Are there any problems here that I need to be aware of that we can work with you? And that that didn't happen, under, unfortunately, under Director, Director DeSanctis' leadership. No. And I was on campus. I was looking him in the eyes. And what do I need to know? What's going on? Is there any problems? And I later found out that just two months uh, before, uh, Two months uh, before I had been on, on campus one time, the IG was there with the conclusion of the report, with recommendations and changes that they were already moving forward on. And I asked them, and they, and they didn't breathe a word of it. And it's just so frustrating. 
because if you lose that trust and then something like this blows up, uh, there's a lot of preventable error that, 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 that we could accomplish. So we, we need to communicate with the leadership of our medical centers that they've got to be upfront and honest with us policymakers for us to make the changes that are necessary. One, one of the things that we've been doing under uh, Leaders Developing Leaders, Bob and I have personally met with the 600 top leaders of the entire department. And one of the messages that we deliver is the message that you just spoke. Uh, it is the importance of openness, of transparency. It's the importance of getting news, whether it be good news or bad news. This is a 180 degree change for this organization. You know, first of all, folks, they weren't, they weren't talking to, to members of Congress or to the media under any circumstance. What right. we're trying to do is to get them to talk both when there's good news or when there's bad news. Bad news don't keep. And so if you got bad news, let's get it out on the table, own the problem, start tackling it, and get it fixed. I mean, that's how you earn trust well, back. And I, again, commend Acting Director Brom because the open policy that she's had, it has been a sea change, and, and I'm sure we're going to see that continue in the future. Thank yes, you, Senator. Congressman Waltz. Same line, and it's it's about improvement, about working towards that. And you've heard it, uh, culture of fear, and, and Senator Johnson rightfully expressed, and I'm uh, grateful for him on on protection of whistleblowers, of making sure folks. And I think that's an, a miss, an unfortunate name we give people. If you look it up, the synonyms are, are are not positive on this. These are ethical employees trying to improve the care for veterans, and that's how they need to be referred to, and that's how they should they should be treated. And uh, Deputy Secretary Gibson and I have both privately and publicly discuss this issue um, and this is a very this is this is frustrating amongst all of you out there and my constituents nothing makes me boiling mad than when you're saying you know someone did something and then you see they're put on administrative leave with pay and you're thinking I would have got fired at my job on that and and all of us up here in five months all of us are up for that we get a performance review and that's good up or down on how it worked there's that sense of frustration but it's also balancing and you have done we've talked through this Due process is important to our system of rule of law. That's due process for the employee and due process for the veteran and their family of trying to strike that balance. And I think as you, as you work with Mr. Kind is right about this, it's the transparency. It's restoring the trust of the veteran and their family so that they know they're going to get the best care, but they trust that it's, it's working for them. So when you hear Mr. Gibson talk about this, this is no small matter. When you hear Title 38 and some of these terms or whatever, this is part of the authority he's talking about, laws that both the Senate and the House passed to allow them to work with as their special uh, executive service folks. These are the top-ranked administrators. Those are the things we're <coughs> trying to get at. And I am not going, and it's not the appropriate place. I think it's an appropriate debate, but the idea of employee due process, sometimes this idea that you should be able to walk in, point a finger, and say you're gone for any reason. I don't think any of us want to live under that, and I don't think any of us want to get rid of the good employees who are there. So what I worry about is we go gung-ho to say, just clean the dang place out and fire all these. You got a food service worker who's been stripped of their right to have someone represent them, bring an allegation forward against bad management, and they don't have anyone to stand for them, and they're gone and the bad management still sets there. So Represent, uh, Secretary Gibson, your point on this is, is you don't need a law to do a lot of these things. What you need is an ethical compass and the moral responsibility to care for our veterans, which I believe we're starting to get there. But what we're hearing from up here is, what can we do to ensure that the public believes that, believes that we're not protecting bad employees, believe we're not uh, protecting and, and giving rights that no one else in society would have for bad employees to continue to draw a paycheck. Um, does the Title 38 and some of these tools, uh, because I can tell you now, if you think it takes a long time to fire somebody, try and hire them at the VA. It takes longer. You've got fresh-faced graduates, psychiatrists, wanting to serve this nation's veterans and they wait nine months to even hear back if they're going to get a job. These people are like Sasquatch. If you find them, take a picture because <laughs> there's none of them. There's none of them. And they're going to, and again, how can we compete if they can go to Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic and make five times as much? Now, I know these people want to serve, 
but there has to be a fairness. So I'm just asking you, Mr. Secretary, how do we strike this balance between appeasing the public's right for justice and getting rid of bad actors? Because I, I deal with this. I'm a school teacher, too. And I know people always say, oh, they can't get rid of a bad school teacher. You know who wants to get rid of a bad school teacher more than anybody? A good school teacher touching next door to them. Yeah. You know one who gets rid of a bad VA employee? A good right. VA employee. So how would, you, how would you describe what we can do to ensure you have those tools? I, I, I think, first of all, the Title 38 provision around senior executives is precisely the right place to go to give us both the authority that we need on hiring as well as the authority that we need uh, from a disciplinary standpoint. I, I, I freely admit there are instances where I start wading into a particular case and I ask out loud, uh, who's the advocate for the veteran in all of this? because there are lots of advocates for the employee. Who's the advocate for the veteran? And I step up and, and, and fill that particular void. Uh, we've got to ensure that we're restoring balance there. And I would tell you one of the most powerful things that any member can do, we all know that there are a lot of good things going on at VA. We all know that. And when there are opportunities to, I'm not saying don't talk about the bad things, because there are bad things that we have to do as well. Just just tell the whole picture. Yes, we got to fix this, we got to fix this, but did you know they're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this? Because the real tragedy comes when veterans who need to come to VA for help or for care don't because of what they've been reading in the media and they stay away. That's the tragedy. You look at some of the suicide numbers and the statistics, and I think we're close to coming out with some refined statistics there. But what we've seen consistently when we've looked is that the pre preponderant number of suicides that veterans uh, commit each, each day are veterans that are, aren't in the VA healthcare system. And you look at the, 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 the old numbers, been 17 of the 22 are veterans that aren't receiving care at VA. We want those veterans into the VA healthcare system if there's any way, shape, or form for us to get in. There are things that we do, Gavin and I have been having this conversation because of some of the transformational work that he's doing. If, if, I, if we sat here and, and spent 30 minutes and talked about all the things that VA does around mental health care, you would realize there is no health care organization in America, perhaps even in the world, that does the things that has the capability that VA has. 550,000 completed mental health outpatient appointments every single month. I mean, the, all of the ancillary support services that we alluded to earlier, it's, it is. I, I would I, argue with I'm you on that. I think this is a very important point you're bringing up, and this is why that simultaneous right. accountability with improvement, if I could, Senator John, just end with this, that we as a nation need to not talk about those 22. We do not need to set expectations that this is an outcome that's going to happen. We've got to talk about names and an individual. So when we're talking about the mistake here, it's Jason and his family. Yes. What we're going to produce in the future is that individual, and I think that attitude yes. takes us in a better direction. Yes. Well, thank you, Congressman Walls. Uh, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here. Uh, another round of questions would, would definitely eat into that time. Uh, so certainly encourage uh, the, the members of the committee here and the congressman to certainly submit uh, questions for the record. Uh, I'm sure we all have additional questions. I want to thank our witnesses, uh, but I particularly want to thank the, the families uh, that suffered this tragedy for and the whistleblowers for coming forward, having the courage to uh, make this public. I know it's not all that easy, but this is what transparency is all about. It's what r really does produce the kind of accountability that uh, uh, and justice that uh, really is deserved here. So with that, I know I've got the, the magic words here somewhere. I got them. <laughs> the hearing record will remain open for 15 days until June 15th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.